Welcome viewers to Berkeley Books, a program of the library at Berkeley College of Music and the Boston Conservatory at Berkeley. We welcome today, Dr. Pooja Agarwal. Dr. Agarwal completed her PhD at Washington University in St. Louis. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Liberal Arts and Sciences here at Berkeley College. For over 10 years, Dr. Agarwal has investigated the links between cognitive science, classroom teaching, and educational policies. While Dr. Agarwal's research includes K through 12, it extends to the university level teaching. Her work has been published in scholarly journals and featured in popular magazines and news, mag news items such as the New York Times, Education Week, and on social media and podcasts. Today, in this session of Berkeley Books, we're speaking with Dr. Agarwal about her book, Powerful Teaching, Unleash the Science of Learning, published with Patrice M. Bain in 2019. Welcome, Dr. Agarwal. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so tell me, how did this book come about? Um, well, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, I'm really excited to share. So this is my book, Powerful Teaching, Unleash the Science of Learning. And it's hard to believe it came out two years ago now. Um, and it was just published in Spanish. So that's oh, really that's, exciting. Yeah. We have a copy in the library. Yes. And I think awesome. the bookstore has some copies as well. That's great. Yeah, um, so it came about because when um, I was in college, actually, I was doing a, a double major in neuroscience and in elementary education, as you had mentioned. And I would take these fascinating research classes on how people would learn and remember from the psychology department on sort of one end of campus. I went to Washington University in St. Louis, and so I'd love these research classes. And then I would walk across campus and I would go to my elementary education classes where I would learn all about learning and memory, but from a classroom perspective. And at some point in college, I had one of those cliched light bulb moments where it just kind of occurred to me that we've got all this research and we need to bring it into the classroom. And we really need to get teachers involved in all of the research that's uh, going on at the time. And so, over the span of my career for 15 years, um, I worked on research with learning and memory, but specifically research with middle school and high school students in the United States. So I really loved being able to bridge that gap between those two areas. And by doing that research to really use it to inform how we can teach more effectively, how teachers and faculty and professors can teach so that students actually remember things. How often, and this yeah. is something I, I mentioned day one with my Berkeley students, how often do you go through a 15 week class, you're into it, you love all the materials, and then winter break or summer break sets in and you've forgotten everything. You just spent 15 weeks learning about a topic and it's all gone. I remember that I loved a Greek mythology class that I took in college and I can't tell you a single thing about it. Maybe I could tell you the professor's name and that's it. So we want our students to remember stuff after they go through this 15 week experience, right? Um, and so uh, I guess about three or four years ago now, I wanted to collaborate with a colleague and friend of mine, Patrice Spain. She was the one that my colleagues and I at Washington University first started doing research with. So we first started um, the initial project in her sixth grade history classroom. Okay. And over the 10 or so years, Patrice and I became really good friends. I did more and more research in her classroom. And it just kind of made sense that I could write a book for teachers. I'm a professor. I love being at Berkeley. I could write that book. And I have that researcher hat as well but it would be a lot more engaging to have a teacher involved. So um, about three years ago is when Patrice and I started writing Powerful Teaching. And uh, it was really exciting to see it come to fruition. Um, it's, it's unique in that it's, to my knowledge, still one of the first and only books that combines um, authors and perspectives and research from a cognitive scientist 
with a classroom teacher. There are books about learning and memory by scientists and books about learning and memory by teachers, but it's nice to finally again have that kind of gap filled in between. All right, bringing it together, the practical and the theoretical. That's lovely. Um, can you explain to our audience a little bit about some of the key takeaways they might get from reading your book? Yes, so there in the book, we focus on four power tools. So with powerful teaching, we have four power tools. And I'll mention the first two. Um, the first one is called retrieval practice. And that's a terminology we've used in cognitive science for 20 years. The research goes back 100 years on how retrieval, going to retrieve something, pulling information out of your head, helps you learn helps you remember that information better. So one example I'd like to ask you uh, is, do you know, this is totally pop quiz, right? Do you know how many bones are in the adult human body? Take a guess. I think there are 203. Very nice. It's 206, but 206. <laughs> very <laughs> close, right? So you retrieve that information. We could literally here on Zoom see that you sort of mentally thought about it. You traveled back and you pulled that information out. That was that's traveling back a long ways. <laughs> <laughs> if I have to go back to ninth grade biology, that's a, that's a ways ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's going to strengthen your memory. Um, and something that I have loved about being at Berkeley, I've been at Berkeley now for five years in the liberal arts and sciences department, and it helped me understand, of course, retrieval practice is what you do in music. It's what you do in the arts, in dance, in theater. You have to play your instrument to get better at it. You can't just watch someone play piano and then perform beautifully at an audition or a gig. You have to practice retrieving that music. But then so often students go into a classroom, especially in liberal arts, where they don't practice at all. In other words, we have to practice our knowledge just like we practice our instruments. Mm -hmm. And so one of the, so this first power tool of retrieval practice is providing a foundation for what is retrieval, what's the research behind it, but then importantly, how do you actually build that into your teaching? And how do you build that into your study? So we provide information for both teachers, faculty, as well as for students. How can you do more of this retrieval? Can I give you a, an example? Okay. Okay. Um, so one example that I really like is just to simply retrieve two things. So, uh, and I like two things just because of the alliteration. But um, in the middle of class, a professor could just pause, have students write down two things they learned or even to just pause and it feels awkward, but to retrieve two things they remember from the previous class and then to continue with the lesson. Or I encourage my students, if they're reading a short chapter from our book, at the, to not take notes, but at the end of when they're done reading that chapter is to write down two things, two key points they can remember that they just learned from that chapter. Because when you're just taking notes, you're not retrieving, you're getting information into your head. And the trick of retrieval, just like music, is getting that information out of your head. Well, some people like me still take notes by hand. Is there any connection by writing it down or taking the notes that's advantageous or? all these years that hasn't been quite as advantageous as we thought. Oh, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, there's actually been a lot of myths around that in the past five years or so. Uh, so the, the quick answer is taking notes with a pen or handwritten versus on a laptop. Both are, neither one will give you an added benefit. Now it makes sense to us that taking notes on a laptop may or may not be better, but students can type really fast. So what students tend to do is they just transcribe everything a professor saying. Yeah. So they have more notes, but then they're just rereading more notes instead of retrieving. So some colleagues of mine um, 
first published a paper in 2014 that got a lot of press about how handwritten notes is better than laptop notes. And then just in the past year, a huge group of like 25 cognitive scientists published research showing, nah, we couldn't replicate that research. Just use whatever note taking you want, but retrieving information is still more beneficial than that note taking to begin with. So uh, taking notes where you're summarizing is not the same as retrieval. It's still just note taking. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so um, why does repetition and retrieval work better? Uh, well, you also talked in your book about spacing and interleaving, mm -hmm. and maybe you can explain that to our audience a little bit about what that is. But then why does that work better than just retrieval alone or repetition alone. So in music, you know, musicians, we are all about repetition and practice and so on, as you mentioned. Um, but yet in these other classes, even though musicians are geared towards retrieval all the time and we're, that's part of who we are, uh, how does this technique uh, add to our ability to retain information? Um, so that's something else I've, I've really enjoyed thinking about at Berkeley that's so different than kind of the way cognitive scientists in the field think about it in general. Um, you had mentioned, uh, let's see, what's an example? So a simple one, um, going back to the classroom example of retrieving two things. The retrieval is helpful. Uh, a professor can pause in the middle of class, have everyone write down two things they learned and move on. But what we know from research is with spacing, if the professor asks students to retrieve two things from the previous day, that added mental challenge, what we call a desirable difficulty, that added challenge from spacing will improve that memory even more. So to our um, audience, spacing means spacing out through time. Yeah. Exactly. Spacing out through time. So a very intuitive way that musicians, artists, dancers, actors do this is with, a, again, a gig or an audition, students don't start practicing the night before an audition or a gig. <laughs> I mean, maybe they do, but they don't really cram, I don't think, right? No, they no. know that they have to practice and space it out over time. And so again, when we think about practicing our knowledge, the exact same principles apply where retrieving and spacing over time will help you with that memory in a way that's that added boost to the foundation of retrieval practice. So a little at a time. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to ask you, um, or if you're using and applying the dis techniques discussed in your book, what might be some of the outcomes the educators can expect to see by applying these techniques into their classes? Hmm. I'll mention at least two outcomes, uh, especially for educators. And I can provide more information about students, but educators specifically some outcomes, two of them. Uh, one is that we can reteach less. Oh. We don't have to keep going over that same information, right? How often is it like, well, I taught this and, you know, the students learned this in ear training one and now it's ear training two and now I have to reteach all that stuff again. Or my students took general psychology and now they're in an upper level psych class at Berkeley and now I have to reteach that stuff again. There's a, as educators, that can be frustrating, right? That's a lot of a time sink. If students remember more information, then we don't have to keep re-presenting it. We can just move on with some of the cool stuff, right? <laughs> we don't have to keep coming back to it. And so even if retrieval or spacing sounds like it takes more classroom time, mm -hmm. it actually saves you time as an outcome because you can move on to other things. Um, a second outcome that I love for educators is we can actually grade less <laughs> with these techniques. So these are a little different than a memory outcome, but 
I'm very much a, a realist and, and on a practical level with retrieval because a large component is practicing over time is instead of giving a big midterm and a big final, in my class, for instance, I give little tiny assignments over time. And it takes me maybe 20 minutes to grade them as opposed to spending hours and hours grading a midterm and a final for 100 students. Mm -hmm. So in some of those ways, another kind of secondary outcome is it makes our lives easier. <laughs> we don't have to reteach and we don't have to keep grading. That, that sounds good to me. <laughs> I'm sure it'll sound good to a lot of people. Um, well, you mentioned that their outcomes might be different for students. What might be some of the expected outcomes for a student and, and, and trying to do these practices? Yeah, I always like thinking about that too. Um, one of them in, in sort of the same way, actually, yeah, in the same way as those two outcomes. One, I had mentioned that teachers um, don't have to keep reteaching. Students don't have to keep restudying. If they remember something better, they don't have to keep rereading their notes and rereading their notes and rereading their notes, right? Or how often students, if they have like a cumulative exam, they go back to the information from the third week of the semester and start all over again. So it saves them time so that they can sleep. Maybe they can exercise. Maybe they would practice more often spend some more time in the practice rooms, I don't know. But students would then have more time as opposed to like this whole constant hamster wheel of restudying. If they can remember, then they can just move on. Does this um, eliminate the need for cramming? It does, yep, um, it does. There are, so there are smaller ways to include retrieval practice, like asking students to write down two things at the end of class or the middle of class. But then there are bigger kind of classroom design, how you design the lessons, the assessment, the grading that we talk about in the book. So there's like two chapters on, on kind of that bigger picture. And I'm happy to share my syllabi or how I structure class. Anyone is welcome to observe and sit in on my classes. Um, but yeah, there's no cramming in my class. Uh, I don't have a midterm or a final. I have a bunch of tiny weekly assignments. And another aspect of that is because there's retrieval, there's spacing over time. Um, all of my assignments are very low stakes. I think they're all worth anywhere from 1% to 5% of students' grades that add up over time. But it helps remind students that retrieval is a good thing. It shouldn't be anxiety provoking. It's something we want to get into the habit of doing is retrieving. I had another question, Dr. Argawal, and that was how can this technique uh, or these techniques in this book aid teachers in their goals to provide a more equitable and level field for all students? And in in, you know, today we, we, we are really concerned about making sure that we incorporate methods that reach all of our students in an equitable way and with all kinds of minorities and all kinds of people uh, in need of, of having that access. Mm -hmm. um, the first thing that comes to mind is that research, for the most part, there needs to be more, but research demonstrates that these power tools, retrieval practice spacing, um, are effective for a wide range of students and actually for a wide range of people. So retrieval practice improves memory for babies. It improves memory for older adults. It improves memory for medical students and also college students, K-12. Uh, and so in that way, I'm encouraged because retrieval practice isn't just something that helps a minority of students, you know, a small subset of students. So it's um, not culturally based. It's, it's bio biologically based yes, or human yeah. based. Right, human-based, I like that, yeah, human-based. Um, because all of our memories, for the most part, work in similar ways. Uh, and so there's research showing, for instance, retrieval practice is effective for students with ADHD, um, and that it's effective for people on the autism spectrum, um, that it improves for language learning. And so because it is, I think, just a simple approach to learning, 
and it's so flexible. There's so many different ways you can do it. I've got Google Forms and a video platform and when we're in person, handwritten forms and all kinds of stuff that in that way, I find it um, to be something that all of my students can engage in. Uh, I've definitely learned over the years at Berkeley how to make my own retrieval practices uh, equitable. And I'm happy to share that uh, with anyone who's interested, especially for um, students who may struggle with English, students who may struggle with time management. Um, it's still this basic approach of practice. In the same way, again, I think that the basic approach of practicing an instrument is, is universal. Mm -hmm. That's really great to know. I really appreciate you talking to me about this book and bringing all of these aspects to our attention. Um, and this has been really a fascinating talk. I'm sure people will now want to dig into this book and find out more. <laughs> and thank you again for being part of this and uh, letting us know about your book. And if you want to show the slide again, uh, slide again uh, of the uh, book, that's great. <laughs> Powerful teaching. Thanks. You want to show um... the, um, picture of the book? Yeah, uh, I do have more resources online. So okay. if anyone goes to retrievalpractice.org, I've got a blog and free downloads. There's also some information about the book at powerfulteaching.org. So retrievalpractice.org or powerfulteaching.org. Anyone's welcome to get in touch over email with me. Uh, I'm on Twitter and so on. So okay. yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you for having me.